if you uh, if you have your picture from when you were you had your first life communion, share that with your child. Because um, uh, passing along those memories, what you remember about your first life communion, uh, is a way to kind of help them get excited about it. Uh, today I'm going to start with just kind of a brief review for you of uh, church um, and of how we become a member of the church through baptism uh, and then uh, what happens in Eucharist, what happens in Mass. So we'll have a brief review of our um, catechetical piece and then after that we'll look at some practical uh, logistics, what to wear, dress code, you know, all kinds of stuff we'll run through the package. Okay? So let's start with um, why we live a sacramental life. Let's get this to work. Okay, let's try that. Okay. We got, God has revealed to us that we have a purpose. And that purpose is union with God in heaven. And that's a good thing, to have a purpose, to have a goal, to know where you're headed. Because then you can direct your steps in the right direction. You've got a direction to go towards. Uh, if you didn't have a goal, you'd kind of be meandering and wondering what to do. So it's a good thing that God gave us a goal. Uh, and part of that goal then uh, is union with him in heaven. Uh, and the way we achieve that union is, of course, with sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. That's when we start here on earth having union with God. Uh, we know that because of original sin, we're born without that union with God. So we're unable to fulfill our purpose when we're born. So Jesus tells us, God tells us, we need a Savior, and that's Jesus. And when Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended up into heaven then he left his apostles as the church to carry on so jesus carried the created the church to carry on his mission and his mission is bringing us all to heaven salvation so the church then carries on jesus's mission of salvation In a sense, then, the church mediates God's grace. Church is the mediator between people and God. It's through church that you receive that union with God. So the church is the universal sacrament of salvation. It mediates God's grace. Uh, it extends, you know, Jesus' mission was in Jerusalem uh, or Israel area, in the area of Galilee, um, at the time that he was alive on earth. So the church then extends his mission throughout space, so throughout um, countries larger than just Israel, so through the United States and, and other countries, also through time, so generations after generations, have access to salvation. And the way we, we achieve salvation is through baptism. In baptism, the human person receives justification. Justification just means that you have the possibility or the opportunity for salvation. It doesn't mean that it's a uh, guarantee. It doesn't mean that you automatically get to heaven no matter what you do. Um, the idea of justification or when Jesus suffered and died and opened the doors to heaven for us was that we had the possibility for it. The goal is there for us now. We can achieve the goal now. Uh, the, I don't know if you recognize in the church, you've got the baptismal font, and it's smack dab right in front of the doors to enter into the, the sanctuary area. And the architects do that on purpose because it's through baptism that you become a member of the church. So you have to go through baptism before you can go through the doors to become a member of the church. In a sense, you go down under the water, you die to your old life where you didn't follow Jesus. So you die to your old life, and when you make that decision to follow Jesus, then you rise up in the new life uh, with the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, 
your um, you have received sanctifying grace through that process. So you're a new creature. You're a new person in the sense that the Holy Spirit now dwells inside of you. Uh, the Greek fathers call it divinization. Not that we are God, but that we participate in the life of the Trinity because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. So we're a new creature, even though you can't see the difference. You can't see any difference between a person who's baptized or a person who's not baptized. That's something that we have to take on faith. God revealed it. Um, and so in the virtue of faith, faith is believing what God has revealed to us. So with that virtue, then, um, we believe that baptism allows us to become a new member of the church, which is also becoming a new member of the body of Christ. Because God then gives us his powers uh, into our soul. He adds additional power into our soul. So let's take a look at what that looks like. In baptism, and also even stronger in confirmation, we're given supernatural gifts. We're given theological gifts. So we're given the um, virtue of faith. Faith is a gift. It's not something you can study and learn. It's not something you can purchase. Uh, it's not something you can go get. Uh, it's a gift from God, and we have to pray for it. We pray for strengthening of faith. Pray for our children to have faith. It's a gift, and we have to nurture it. Um, so you have your theological virtues. You have your cardinal virtues. Uh, we have the gifts of the Spirit. All of those things God gives us in baptism, and he gives us of his um, virtues. So he gives us of his wisdom and his understanding and his counsel. So it's the sense of us with God inside of us working together to achieve our goal of salvation. So God doesn't expect us to do it on our own, uh, by ourselves. He gives us himself in these virtues, strengthening our virtues uh, in order that we can get up into heaven. Baptism restores what was lost with original sin. Before original sin, when they were Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were able to talk with God. They had that, that physical intimacy where they could talk with God and walk with God in the garden. Um, they had a sense of original justice where they knew God was God and they were creatures uh, and they knew that they were supposed to obey God. Um, and yet they lost that through disobedience. Uh, so Jesus is, part of Jesus' reason for baptizing us is to bring us back to what we lost when Adam and Eve sinned. So we're getting back some of the things that we lost with original sin. And we get this through Christ. Because Christ is the head of the body of Christ, through Christ, this life of Christ flows from Christ to all of us as his members of his body. Uh, and it flows to the extent that we're disposed to receive it. So the extent that we want it, the extent that we're praying for it, to the extent that we're working towards it, um, that's the extent of the amount of Christ's life that is able to um, grow inside of us. Okay. Any questions on that part of baptism yet? Okay, then moving on, baptism makes us a part of the mystical body of Christ, which is the same thing as the church. So when you go through that baptismal font and you go into the sanctuary, all of us together are the mystical body of Christ. Um, the head and the members are all one mystical person. So Jesus, together with us, we're kind of grafted into the life of Christ. And so all of Christ's merits, all of Christ's satisfactions, uh, he shares with all of us then. So his virtues, he shares with us. And we are fully ourselves only as we exist as members of the body. Uh, this is what we're created to be, community. We're created to be church together. God doesn't create uh, one person and just for, for individual salvation. He calls together the nation of the Israelites. He calls together the new Jerusalem, uh, all of us, the um, Christians. We do this together as a group. No one of us is given all of the gifts that we need to get to heaven. We're given different 
gifts and different things that we can share with each other. So the sense of being a part of a community, part of a church, is very important to Jesus. Now what's the activity that baptized people do together? What's the one thing that all of us do together? What do Catholics do? Do we do pray? Um, there's a specific way that we pray when we gather together. What do we do together in prayer? What was that? We do kneel. Where do, where do we kneel? In church, right? We, are, we usually meet once a week in Sunday in Mass, right? That's what Catholics do. We don't necessarily all go to the ball game together. We don't necessarily all go out to eat at a restaurant together. We don't necessarily all go on vacation together. But the one activity that we all do together is Mass. We all gather for prayer. We all gather for liturgy. And the reason that we do that is so that God, who, who um, we're all the mystical, part of, part, mystical body of Christ, uh, God uses us to carry on his mission in the world. And he does that largely through mass. So let's look at how that works. Mass is the place of greatest encounter with God. This is the place where it is the easiest to encounter God, <coughs> where we are the closest to God that we will ever be in, uh, while we're on this earth. Um, and so... The biggest part of Mass is that we are going so that together all of us can encounter our God. And it's hard to encounter God because you can't see Him. He's not a physical, material being, and, and you know, we're so used to physical, material things. Um, it's easy for us to relate to the material world much easier than to the spiritual world. Uh, so we encounter God, and we encounter God four <coughs> ways in the Mass. Does anybody have any sense? When do we encounter God in Mass? Through communion. That's probably the largest, the biggest, the most uh, significant time that we encounter Christ is in His real presence in communion. Yeah. There are three other ways that we also encounter God in Mass. The readings. The readings, absolutely. The Word of God, the Logos, the Wisdom. Um, that which has created the order of our world and that became human, um, that word we encounter at Mass. And that word forms us every bit as much as communion forms us. When we receive Jesus, um, his, word for, his presence forms us and the word forms us. Okay, two other ways that we encounter God in the Mass. Yeah, we are praying to God, but we're actually encountering him, we're actually touching him um, uh, through the priest who stands in persona Christi, in the place of Christ. Uh, as we're gathered at Mass and we're the mystical body of Christ, the priest takes the um, place or the position of Christ as head of the body, and he leads us in worship, leads us in prayer. So it's through the priest that we also encounter Christ. And it's also through each other. Each of you have Christ within you. And so when we encounter each other and we support each other and encourage each other and smile and greet each other, we are encountering Christ in each other during Mass. So there's lots of ways that we encounter Christ in Mass. It's hard to talk about what happens in Mass because it's a spiritual reality. So much of what happens, we can't see. We can't see God's Holy Spirit in our souls. We can't see the degree of virtues we have. Oh, you know, this person has 23% of patience and this person has 85% of patience. You can't see it. Uh, so much of our... Um, relationship with God is, is it's what we sense 
we sense God saying something to us or moving us or we sense that we need to pray more or that we need to do uh, give more to the poor or you know you just have a sense and a felt experience in relationship with God you know you, you go out on a starry night and you see the vast um, beautiful sky the beautiful universe and you're filled with wonder and awe or you see the birth of a baby and that doesn't bring you um, wonder and awe you know I don't know what what else would First time that I think the only time I've ever seen my husband cry was when our baby was, was born. Um, so there's a sense, there's a deep intelligibility um, that it's hard to describe. It's hard to talk about um, this mystical union with God that we encounter in Mass. Um, just realize that it is uh, help your child to be aware of the signs. You know. If you're um, singing a song in Mass and it brings tears to your eyes, you're encountering God there. The Holy Spirit is working. If you're reading the Word, uh, hearing the homily, um, and something clicks for you, or something you understand it in a way that you hadn't understood, or uh, it was encouraging and motivating, the Holy Spirit is there for you. Um, so part of getting your child ready for First Holy Communion and participating in Mass, help them see where the Holy Spirit is working, uh, which also entails in us being aware for ourselves. Where is the Holy Spirit working in our own hearts during Mass? Mass is called the liturgy, is one type of liturgy. Any time when Catholics gather for prayer or Christians gather for prayer, they call it a liturgy. Uh, so you could gather for the rosary and that would be a liturgy. You could gather for um, praying the divine office, the morning prayer, or something, and that's a liturgy. Uh, liturgy is called the work of the people. It's a work because you're continuing Jesus' mission. You're continuing to save souls. And in Mass, there's lots of ways that we save souls. We're saving souls when we pray the intercessions. We're praying for the world. We're praying for our priests and our church. We're praying for our children. Um, so part of uh, when we gather, uh, prayer is part of that saving the world. Um, we join Jesus in sacrificing for the world. And so we'll look at how the Mass is a sacrifice. Uh, we're also nourished at Mass. We're nourished as in a meal. So there is a sense where Mass is both uh, a sacrifice and a meal. Now at this point, I'll let you open up your parent packet and look at the manila paper, the second to last page of the manila paper. It's called the graded course of study, grade two, your mastery, skill, concepts or skills. The archbishop is the one who is in charge of determining what our children learn at each grade level. What does he want second graders to know? So this is the checklist of all second graders. He wants all second graders to know these things by the time they're finished with second grade religious ed or second grade school or second grade PRP. Um, so this is for you, just so that you are aware of what the archdiocese uh, would like covered. Um, because you're the primary catechist for your children, you're around them um, more, you know, more than any of any of your teachers or anyone else. Uh, you have formative times during your life and during your child's life where you can help form them. Uh, so we wanted you to know these. If you look down at number eight, for second graders, the Archdiocese wants them to define Eucharist as a sacred meal. So we're gonna go talk about how do you explain that to your child, that the Eucharist is a sacred meal. I mean, what does that mean? And then the next one, define Eucharist as a celebration. What, what are we celebrating in the Eucharist? Okay? Um, so we'll look at Mass as a sacrifice, we'll look at Mass as a meal, and we'll look at Mass as a celebration. Um, part of the answer to that question is as define Eucharist as a celebration. Um, it says, what do Catholics celebrate together? We celebrate 
the Eucharist. So helping them to understand that man, when we gather, we gather to celebrate the Eucharist. We're celebrating God's love. We're celebrating Jesus suffering and dying and opening the doors to heaven for us. We're celebrating his presence in the Eucharist. We're celebrating being a member of church, a member of the body of Christ. Lots of good things that we celebrate during Mass. Okay, how do we understand Mass as a sacrifice? Um, this happens during the offertory part of Mass. The whole essence of the Mass, the main thing that we're doing at Mass, is that Christ is offering himself to God, the Father, for the sins of the world. That's his work of salvation. That's what he did on the cross. That's what opened the gates of heaven for all of us. So the essence of Mass, the main thing that we are doing in Mass, is that God, that Jesus himself, is offering himself to the Father for the sins of the world. Okay. Now, we're part of the mystical body of Christ, right? We're grafted onto the life of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit within us. What does that mean for us? Where does that put us at man's? Mass is Christ offering himself to the Father for the sins of the world. And then if we're grafted onto Christ, what's Christ lifting up? Absolutely. Christ is offering himself and us. Because we're grafted onto Christ. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. Um, the, the priest, acting in persona Christi, is offering Jesus, offering the um, consecrated host that turns into Jesus' real presence, offering Jesus up to the Father along with all of us because we're grafted onto Christ. We're members of the body of Christ. So all of us are offering our sacrifices, our sufferings of the week. We all got up early and went to work when we didn't feel like it. We all washed the dishes and, and made dinner when we didn't feel like it. We all had to put the kids to bed when we would rather sit down and watch television. In a hundred ways, you as a parent are offering sacrifice for the good of your family. In a hundred different ways each week, you are living the Christian life by doing what you're supposed to be doing, doing your um, duty in life, your, your job as a parent, taking care of your spouse, taking care of your children, going to work to pay the bills, that kind of stuff. And at Mass, you are uniting all of those to Jesus, and Jesus is offering himself and all of us with all of our gifts, all of our sacrifices up to the Father for the salvation of the world. So we are saving the world when we go to Mass. So you can tell your children they are superheroes when they go to Mass. They are truly saving the world when, they're, when they are participating in Mass. Okay, then we go on to Mass as a meal. God nourishes us with his very self, with his real presence in the Eucharist. And that real presence, God is the divine physician, so he heals us physically where, where, he, where we need to be healed. Um, God is, um, has all patience. He's 100% patient, so when we need patience, he feeds us with more with a, of his patience to help us grow. Um, no, no matter what virtue it that we need, whether it's we need more faith, whether it's we need more hope in, the, in these um, challenging times, whether it's we need more peace, um, whatever it is that we need spiritually, we get that in the Eucharist. Because God is the fulfillment of all things. He has all virtues. He has all goodness. Uh, he's infinite love, infinite um, Anything that we could need or want, he's there. So that to the extent that we are disposed to receive him, that we're eagerly looking forward to receiving him, we're praying and, and asking for his gifts, he gives of himself to us. So in that sense, 
Mass is a meal, and the Eucharist is a meal. Jesus found a way by which he could ascend in heaven and yet remain on earth. He instituted the sacrament of the Eucharist so that he might stay with us and be the food of our soul. That's St. John Vianney. Food of our soul, okay? It goes back to who are we as human persons? We're, we are physical bodies. We are physical animal bodies. But we are also spiritual souls. And so we eat to maintain healthy bodies but we also need things to nourish our soul, to nourish our spiritual soul. There's a couple different ways that Mass does that. One of the things that Jesus says is that truth is a type of food. Truth is a type of nourishment. So in Matthew, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So there's a sense for Jesus that the word that came out of God's mouth nourishes him more than bread. There's a sense that God's word is food, is nourishment for him. So obviously he's not talking about his body, he's talking about his spiritual soul. So truth nourishes us. There's a second sense where law or obedience to God's will nourishes us. And Jesus said in John, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So again, there's a sense where Jesus is talking about doing God's will, obeying God, uh, and in extension on earth here, Jesus is um, creating the church, obeying the church rules, obeying the church's precepts. There's a sense where that is nourishment for our souls. And of course, last with the Eucharist, the bread which I give, which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus talks about his Eucharist as being a type of food. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So this is the nourishment that we need in order to get us to heaven. Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. So it's, it's so essential, the nourishment of the Eucharist is so essential that unless you eat of it, you won't have God's life in, in, within you. You won't be able to maintain and keep that sanctifying grace that you received at baptism. You need that nourishment of the Holy Spirit and the nourishment of Jesus in the Eucharist in order to get to heaven. Mass forms us in our virtues. Um, we would ask, what virtues do I have to have within myself so that I can be happy, live a good life, live life right, live life well? And what virtues do I have to foster in my children so that they can be happy, so that they can succeed in life, so that they can um, live life well and do it well? All of our virtues are strengthened by the grace given us to in Mass provided that we're disposed to receive it. So all those different nourishments that we receive in the Word, in the Eucharist, in obeying the, the God's law, all of those um, give us grace so that we can grow in holiness. Uh, we have to grow closer and more and more like Jesus um, to the extent that we're disposed to receive it. I don't know if you've heard the term grace builds on nature. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. Basically what that means is first we have to decide we're going to do it uh, and we have to take the steps to do it uh, and then God gives us grace and aids our efforts um, and rises us up so that we're able to do things that we're not able to do on our own. Um, for instance, um, um, during Lent, if I give up chocolate, I mean, I'm going to make that determination, I'm going to try but I can guarantee you my self-discipline is not going to be strong enough to get through all that by myself. So to the extent that I'm praying and asking God for help, His um, grace will come in and help me when I would normally just give up on my own. So together with Him, I'm able to do things that I can't do on my own.
Let everyone be struck with fear, the whole world tremble, and the heavens exult when Christ, the Son of the living God, is present on the altar in the hands of the priest. That's St. Francis of Assisi. This is the sense where we want to help our children learn reverence for the Eucharist. We want to help them learn that uh, we don't want to receive Jesus unworthily. But if you know that you have a mortal sin, then don't go up to receive First Holy Communion. There's a sense where St. Paul chastises one of his churches. He said, you're, you're, um, you're receiving, you're celebrating, you're receiving uh, the Eucharist together, and it's doing you harm because you're uh, reveling and, and you're overeating and you're letting other people go um, hungry. Uh, so St. Paul, in one of his letters, was um, chastising one of the churches, saying, you're not worthily receiving the Eucharist and it's doing you more harm than good. Uh, so there's a sense where you don't want to receive Eucharist if you know you're in moral sin. So encourage your children, make sure they get to confession on a regular basis. Um, and if they know that they've committed a moral sin, then go to confession before you receive the Eucharist. Mass is right worship. Injustice, praise is due to God. Since God created us, it's just just, it's just right that we recognize that. Sanctifying grace allows us to give right praise because it's the Holy Spirit inside of us helping us pray. So it's the Holy Spirit inside of us worshiping and praising God. So God is praising himself in a, in a sense, and he knows what pleases him the best. So there's a sense where mass is right worship. So what's so important about worship? And this comes from Robert Barron, Bishop Robert Barron. He says, to worship is to order the whole of one's life towards the living God, and in doing so to become interiorly and exteriorly rightly ordered. To worship is to signal to oneself what one's life is finally about. Worship is not something that God needs, but it is something very much that we need. So worship, God creates worship and, and asks us to come to church once a week on Sunday and holy days because we need it. Uh, God doesn't need it, but we need it. Living a sacra sacramental life then helps us to achieve our purpose in life, helps us to become the person we were created to be, helps us to become self-actualized, brings us greater happiness, greater contentment, peace, integrity, self-esteem. It fosters our personal experience of God and is living life well. So those are the reasons why we would want to bring up our children um, in a sacramental life, practicing a sacramental life. Doing that means uh, following the church's teachings, uh, going to Mass every Sunday um, and, and on Holy Days, and that's hard to do. That's a discipline. And that type of obedience to God begins with humility. Again, one of the virtues that we need to cultivate within ourselves, that we may not have enough of within ourselves, but we ask God for his, um, by the merits of Jesus, we ask for his um, virtue of humility. So how do we prepare our children? You are already doing a great job as an example of God's love and forgiveness. So you, what you're already doing, helping your children, loving your children, all of that, you're already doing a good job in terms of showing your child an example, a physical, tangible example of God's love and forgiveness. Help teach your child dependence on God for your needs and model it. So pray for your needs of your family together with your child. Help your child know that when they have a need, when they have a test that they have to take, um, when they have a bullying situation that they, they need help with, help them to learn to depend on God. Um, grace builds on nature, so you've got to take the first steps, but then you've got to ask God to help you. And then he adds to your efforts, and, and you are able to do things more than you can do just on your own. Attend Mass weekly as a family. You can prepare your Mass by doing the Lexio on the Gospel. 
The Lexio is reading the Sunday Gospel and seeing what strikes you. It's interesting to do it with your children because it gives you a sense of whatever is striking them. They tell you, well, this, you know, if they pick out a word that strikes them or a phrase that strikes them, it gives you a chance to see kind of what they're thinking. It gives you a chance to um, see what, what's in, in their hearts, what they're kind of mulling over in their heads. Fosters communication. Help your child how to participate in the Mass, know what the Mass responses that are, when to kneel, when to stand, that kind of stuff. We're going to do the walk through the Mass as a way to help them learn what to say, when, that kind of thing. Um, and then teaching your child reverence in Mass, um, not talking before Mass. Um, after you receive the Eucharist, take time in quiet prayer or thanksgiving, that kind of thing. Um, find your ministry in church. We're all a body part of the mystical body of Christ because we have ministry together. We all have gifts that we pull together. Many of you are working on the gala right now. That's your ministry at, at this point um, in our church, in our church of calendar year. Um, finding your ministry and helping to build up the church builds you up, builds the church up, makes it all of us stronger. Encourage participation in the children's liturgies. Once a month, during the academic calendar, we have a weekend mass that is, has a different grade. Um, so when the second grade comes in, I, we've had that second grade already. So when third grade next year comes, I encourage your children to participate in it. It helps your children know the parts of the mass. Okay, if I'm an usher, when do I go back? You go up after, after the intercession. Well, what are the intercessions? And what part of the mass are the intercessions? You know? um, do it. Giving them a job to do during Mass helps them to know the parts of the Mass and, and when to, how to move around the church respectfully. Uh, and finally, uh, attending an adult Bible study or doing a program on the form. Um, your personal relationship with Jesus is a lifelong endeavor. So the more you're learning or reading a good spiritual book or something like that, um, it shows your children that Religious ed isn't something that you stop at eighth grade, uh, or if you go to a Catholic high school, stop after your Catholic high school. It's a lifelong thing. It's for everyone. Your walk with Jesus is a lifelong walk. Okay. Any questions about any questions about the um, church baptism, the Eucharist, that kind of thing? Okay. And let's run through our parent packet. On the first page, I just want to uh, draw you to some of the dates that are important. We're going to have a walk through the Mass on Thursday, February 21st, over in, it'll be in the church. Um, then we have our Holy Communion Mini Retreat. The Mini Retreat will be Sunday, March the 10th. Um, I'm not sure of the exact times uh, at the Reconciliation retreat, retreat, Tina said, well, you can come at 10.30, the first group can come at 10.30, the next group can come at 11.30, because it only really takes about an hour. Um, but then she thought, well, maybe I, she was going to look at maybe doing something different for First Holy Communion, uh, just so it would be a different experience. Um, so she's going to let me know the date, so I'll pass that on um, when it comes. Uh, it'll still be March 10th. It'll still be in the cafeteria here where we start. Um, but whether we run it at 10.30 and 11.30 or whether we run it at 10 and like 12.30 or something like that, we'll get those times to you. And you can switch if something's going on in the morning and you're, you're, it's better for you to do the later one. You know, you, you can go to whichever one. We just try and divide it equally so that there's not a big run on one time and too many people at one time and not enough at another. Uh, does everybody know the times of the rehearsals for their mass? If you don't, I have everybody's uh, rehearsal scheduled here. If you want, uh, if you have a question about that, I have that information here. Pictures. We have Life Touch coming. Uh, they don't have their forms for us yet, but they promise it by the the mini retreat. So when you come to the mini retreat, you can pick up your Life Touch picture forms if you want. You don't bring money up to us, we, Tina or I don't collect it. You just bring your completed form along with your check to the church 
And what they want is if you want a picture, they want to see you 45 minutes before mass. And then everybody, whether you purchase a picture or not, they want everybody at your First Holy Communion Mass at least 20 minutes early because they're going to take a group picture. So we have seven masses on seven, masses on seven different days, so we'll have seven different group pictures, and each one of them will be taken 20 minutes before that mass. Um, so at least be there by 20 minutes before mass uh, if you don't want pictures, and 45 minutes if you do. Uh, how's everybody doing with their banners? It's too early. It's too early. It's too early. Too early. Did, everybody, did everybody get the banner hit? Okay. Okay. Gentle remember, reminder to start working on the banner. Um, you want to bring your banner to you with you at First Holy Communion Mass. And you'll hang it on the pew. Each family will have their own pew. Uh, and you'll hang it on your pew when you come in. Okay, on the back of that is just a plug-in for the um, Married Couples Dinner February 9th, so if you'd like to treat yourself to a Married Couples Dinner. And then on your pink paper, you have a dress code. So girls, they can wear a white or a cream-colored dress, uh, regular length um, or longer, um, with covered shoulders. So we don't want spaghetti straps. If you have a dress that has spaghetti straps, just put a uh, sweater on or something. Uh, so it should have like, uh, they usually say like three fingers length on the shoulders here. Um, bales are not required, but if your daughter would like to wear one, she can just make sure it's away from the face so they don't put in front of them and they don't get heated, overheated. Some of the girls sometimes like to wear gloves. If they want to wear gloves, they're welcome to, but they have to take those off before they go up for communion. For the boys, dress slacks, dress shirt to tie, dress shoes. You do not have to wear a suit. You do not have to wear a blazer or a sport coat. A sport coat is preferred, but if you don't have that or you know, if they've outgrown it, uh, you don't have to do that. Um, any questions on the dress code? Okay, on the back of that sheet are some dinner conversations you can have with your child. Things that. Yeah. Do you want to keep mailers not? Oh. It says to contact the mailer. Thank you. Um, I couldn't find the. the um, all I could find was a PDF of last year. I couldn't find a Word document. Um, so, yes, it's not Pete Taylor. If you have any questions, it's Tina Romando. Same number, just Tina Romando. Thank you, Tammy. Well, on the back of your pink sheet, you have discerning readiness for First Holy Eucharist. <coughs> um, so those are some things you can go over with your child, just questions to ask them, see how they answer, uh, see if they're ready. That um, You can pick up if they're uh, understanding what they're learning at this point.